We completed the cla earlier class on cell cycle and we now continue with another important molecular topic that is apoptosis. The apoptosis, the word means the fall of leaves. That means, in other words, from the molecular aspect, it is the death of a cell. So when we studied cell cycle, we understood that a cell enters G1, S, G2, M. That is how the life of a cell goes on as it moves through the cell cycle. But a time comes when the cell is also uh, instructed to die. And when such a time comes where the cell is instructed to die, then the cell usually opts for programmed cell death. That is, these make a pathways programmed within a cell and can only be initiated when certain stimuli or certain signals are perceived by the cell. This, this is a recapitulation of what we did. did. If you look into the life of a cell, as you can see, it starts from G1, S, G2, M. So that is, it goes on and on, unless and until signals are perceived by the cell that instructs the cell to undergo cell death. The concept of cell death was first proposed in 1842 by Karl Vogt. Later on, in around 1965, at the John Foxton Ross, uh, sorry, at the University of Queensland, John Foxton Ross Kane was able to distinguish apoptosis from traumatic cell death. Understand that death is dead, but when there is a cellular death, the death can be sudden and traumatic, and the death can occur in a programmed manner. So this distinction was first done by Kerr at the University of Queensland in 1965. Thereafter, Kerr was invited by Alistair Curry and Andrew Willey to join the University of Aberdeen in 1972. And the three of them then published their paper on this particular facet of cellular life in the British Journal of Cancer in 1972. But all the three credits James Cormack for using the term apoptosis. As I said, the word apo means from and tosis means falling of leaves. So falling. Remember, the pronunciation is not apoptosis. No, it's not that how you pronounce that. It is apoptosis. So when you pronounce apoptosis, don't say it as apoptosis. No, it's apoptosis. The basic biology in the process of uh, what happens in apoptosis was shown by Horvitz in 1999, where he was studying uh, an uh, experimental uh, organism that is the nematode Cynorhabditis elegans. And he observed that the organism has 1090 somatic cells. And during his development, it in, during the development of the adult worm, 131 of these cells undergo programmed cell death. So this is a normal physiological phenomenon. Thus, when the worm matures into adult, in its process, it is allowing 131 cells to die, which is found this phenomenon is found in almost all worms, demonstrating the remarkable accuracy and control in the system. So the death of those 131 cells are necessary for maturation of the organism. So that was the beginning of apoptosis. And later on, a number of forms of death have been discovered. I just like you to note this particular three forms of death. The first comes autophagy. Autophagy means degradation of cellular components within the dying cell, a cell which is dying. The cellular components within the cell degrades and forms small vacuoles. Necrosis, now this is a traumatic death, a violent and a quick form of degeneration affecting extensive cell population. For example, if you bang on a door with your head, you will see that automatically your head is hurt 
And then very next day, you will see a very reddish scar on the forehead. That means that, and gradually the scar will become bluish and so on. So this means that the cells which had initially suffered that traumatic blow have died. And in this case, the death is mostly necrosis because as a result of such a traumatic blow, what happens? The degeneration of the cells were quick. Cytoplasmic swelling took place, destruction of organelles, disruption of the plasma membrane, leading to the release of intracellular contents. This causes inflammation. Inflammation means, uh, when I'm using the word inflammation in this context, you have to understand that when a cell is dying and if its internal contents are poured out into the cellular environment, this contents then attracts different immune cells towards it. That means it is this uh, contents are in a way telling the body that a cell has died and a cell has died a traumatic death and you need to take care of that part. And so the immune cells are now moving to that part to check if there is any foreign element in that cellular content or not. So very roughly and in a very simplified way, I, I just wanted to explain you what is inflammation. I can give you another analogy of inflammation, a real life analogy. For example, if there's a fire in someone's house, a small fire, now the, when the fire starts in a small manner, what do you do? You bring a fire extinguisher and you start calling people, you yell people, you phone the, um, I mean to say the fire brigade. That means by yelling, by telephoning, by asking, uh, uh, yelling and telling others come and help, you are actually telling people that there is a small fire in your house. You are informing others that there is a fire in the house, come and help or otherwise it will go out of hand. So the body also responses in this very similar manner when there is some kind of a traumatic death at a particular place. The death, the information of that traumatic death is being informed to all the cells of the body and specifically the immune cells who come into that point to check if there is any foreign pathogen or element present in that cellular debris so that they will kill that foreign pathogen. And finally, we come to apoptosis. Apoptosis is a very organized program cell death. And the processes that takes place in apoptosis are very defined. The cell shrinks, the plasma membrane blebs. I'll show you what blebbing means. This is blebbing. If this is a cell, when I'm saying that blebbing of a plasma membrane, so it blebs, small, small vesicles are formed. The organelles maintain the integrity, condensation and fragmentation of the DNA occurs, followed by removal of this apoptotic cells by phagocytosis. Now you must be aware of the term phagocytosis. Phagocytosis means some cells of our body are capable of engulfing cellular debris. A typical beautiful example of a phagocytic cell is macrophage, which is a category of immune uh, WBC, uh, white blood cell found in our blood circulatory system. So those cells are capable of phagocytosis. Now, so if we move into apoptosis, as I was showing uh, via this picture, that you can see that this is a normal cell. And whenever there is a stimuli, which is asking the cell to die, whenever there is an apoptotic stimuli, you can see that chromatin comp compaction, mild convolution and condensation of the cytoplasm is occurring. Gradually, you can see this is called membrane blabbing. So blabbing of the membrane is occurring, nuclear fragmentation, cellular fragmentation. And finally, this cellular debris is then phagocytosed by a phagocytic cell. So the apoptotic pathway when operative in a cell occurs in a very cellular, in a very programmed defined manner. You can understand the concept of molecular programming because you have already studied cell cycle. The entry of a cell into the M phase and the exit from M phase. If you remember, 
was also an example of molecular programming. Activation of cyclin B and CDK1 followed by degradation of cyclin B by NFS promoting complex results in entry and exit of the cell from NFS. So it's very similar. So when we are talking about apoptosis, the program here is also very similar. There are two programs operative within a cell that can lead to two categories of a cellular death. And whenever that death starts, these are the outputs you can see. From the exterior, you can see that the cell is showing fragmentation. We are seeing the membrane blabing. We are seeing DNA fragmentation. And finally, the cell is killed by a phagocytic cell. So it's a philosophy of life. Just as we are born to die, a cell is also born to die. Our death is not programmed. If we talk about human life, death is sudden. Death will happen invariably one day. But when it will happen, nobody knows. But for a cellular life, death to some extent is programmed. Now the question is that automatically that comes to mind is that when will a cell decide it will die? Yes, that decision is also programmed. The decision is made by the fact that you people have studied telomere, telomerase and replication problem in DNA. And if you remember the DNA has telomere repeats at its two ends. And in each cycle of replication, the daughter DNA shortens with respect to the mother cell. So every daughter cell coming from a mother cell has a bit shorter DNA than that of the mother cell. This goes on unless and until the daughter cell reaches a point where the DNA reaches a critical length. The DNA has shortened to such an extent that now it has reached a critical length and the cell cannot be allowed to enter into cell cycle anymore because now if the cell is allowed to enter into cell cycle with that critical length of DNA, we'll be getting some abnormal cellular functions. So the cell is then instructed to die. This is one way of, the, of uh, what to say, determining the fate of a cellular life. Sometimes our immune cells of our body, when they recognize that a um, self cell, our body cell has been infested with foreign elements, then that self cell is also instructed to die. So molecular death to some extent is programmed. Molecular life to some extent is also programmed. When we are looking at the biochemical changes that takes place, as I said, you're looking at the cell from the exterior. We are not moving into the cell. We are looking at the cell from the exterior. The basic biochemical changes that are observed in a dying cell is that its DNA is cleaved. If you remember, we have studied for phosphor plasma membrane in this semester only. That was my first topic I took. And one of the important phospholipids present in the plasma membrane is phosphatidylserine. If you recapitulate your concept, phosphatidylserine is located in the inner leaflet of the lipid bilayer. So whenever cellular death starts, the phosphatidylserine moves from the inner leaflet to the outer leaflet of the plasma membrane. That means Phosphatidylserine is now exposed on the surface of the plasma membrane. So that is a second change that is associated with the dying cells. The third change is that you have studied mitochondria in 11 and 12, and you know the importance of mitochondria with respect to a cellular life. It's the respiratory storehouse of a cell. So whenever the cell is dying, the first organelle that is compromised is mitochondria. The membrane potential across the mitochondrial inner membrane is lost and cytochrome C, one of the important molecules, is a biomolecule responsible for the electron transport chain, which is usually present in the intermembrane space of the mitochondria, comes out into the cytoplasm. So the leakage of cytoplasm into the uh, sorry, the leakage of cytochrome C into the plasma membrane is almost informing everyone in the vicinity that the cell is ultimately dying. 
So these are the four biochemical changes that are observed when the cell undergoes an apoptotic death. Now, as I said, that those biochemical changes are associated with the fact that these changes can be observed from the exterior. One of the changes I just now discussed was that the externalization of the phosphatidylserine. So you can look, this is the plasma membrane lipid bilayer. This is an apoptotic cell. <coughs> Excuse me. This is an apoptotic cell. Just a second. This is an apoptotic cell and its plasma membrane has been magnified and shown. And you can see the presence of the plasma membrane on the inner lipid, the, on the inner leaflet of the lipid bilayer. And as the apoptosis starts within the cell, you can see that the phosphatidylserine is now moving out into the outer leaflet. Now, this phosphatidylserine in turn can be recognized by certain proteins once they move out on the surface of the plasma membrane, not before that. They are bound by certain proteins known as annexin 1 and MFG8. And these proteins are then recognized by phagocytic cells, which can then engulf the apoptotic cells. Because you remember that you must have this idea that the phagocytic cells are always patrolling in our body. They need to distinguish between normal healthy cells and apoptotic cells. Now, whenever phosphatidylserine moves out onto the outer leaflet, you can see externalization of the phosphatidylserine is an indication to the phagocytic cell that this, this cell is dying. So you come and eat me, you come and engulf me. So that is one indication, that is one biochemical change that indicates a nearby phagocytic cell to come and engulf an apoptotic cell. In molecular laboratories, this phenomenon of apoptosis can be detected by a, a fluorescent molecule that is an exon V. So we can tag an exon, we can tag, we can um, identify this an exon, we can bind to phosphatidylserine if the cell can be isolated. And if an exon V fluorose, then we can understand that the cell is dying in apoptotic death. So that was one biochemical change that can be detected in the molecular laboratory. Now we are coming to the second biochemical change that can also be detected at the molecular level as I was talking about DNA fragmentation. Now in normal condition, just to, before entering into the um, concept of DNA fragmentation, keep it in mind that our chromosomes are present in a nucleosomal model. So we have this nucleosome wrapping around certain part of DNA and the nucleosomes are present and in between the presence of the linker DNA. So that is a chromosome model. One more thing to keep it in mind that just as in cell cycle, we studied some partner proteins. We had the cycling CDKs. So they were partners. When we will be studying the apoptotic pathway, we will again get some proteins. I'm just comparing. When we studied the enzymes of the cell cycle pathway, what you saw, most of the enzymes are kinases or phosphatases. Kinases are enzymes that add phosphates. Phosphatases are enzymes that remove phosphate. But when we will be moving into the enzymes of the apoptotic pathways, you'll be seeing that most of the enzymes in these pathways are proteases. When I use the word proteases, that means these enzymes are able to cut its target substrate. They'll simply cut or fragment its targets, proteases. That means they will cut its target into smaller fragments. Now, when I talk about the word endonucleases, remember, nucleases, this means the enzymes which are nucleases, they will cut DNA into smaller fragments. So when we are entering into apoptotic pathways, as, as you can understand, this is a pathway which will ultimately lead to the death of a cell. Most of the enzymes are either proteases or nucleases. That means they will either cut proteins, target proteins, or they will either cut target DNA. Now, as I was saying, saying you, 
that how do we detect apoptosis in the laboratories? One was, just now as I discussed, the externalization of phosphatidylserine. The second criteria was that in apoptotic cells, we see DNA fragmentation. So fragmented DNA is a, a, a presence of fragmented DNA tells us that apoptosis has occurred in the cell. Now this picture on the top right is telling you how our DNA is present in the cell. So whenever there is a normal cell, a normal cell has an endonuclease present in the cytoplasm, which is a caspase activated DNAs. But in normal condition, as you can understand, caspase activated DNAs. So it is a DNAs. It can go and kill fragment DNA. But see the name, caspase activated DNAs. So there is this caspase, which is again an enzyme, but it is a protease. When I'm talking about CAD, it has, so this is caspase activated DNAs. Caspase is a protease. DNAs is a, it is a nuclease. So this caspase activated DNAs enzyme can be activated by the enzyme caspase. This is a group of enzymes. I'll come to caspase later on. For now, let us understand that caspases are a group of proteases. So whenever these caspase activated DNAs are activated, they move into the nucleus and then they can cut the DNA in the linker regions. If you remember the nucleosomal model, there was this DNA wrapped around the nucleosome and in between the two nucleosomes, there is this small amount of linker DNA present. So as you can see in this picture, to show you in this picture, so this is the, just a second. So this is the nucleosomal model. And these are the linker DNA, it's the linker DNA. These are the linker DNA, it's linking two nucleosomes. So whenever there is this activated caspase acti DNAs, it will go and cut this linker region. And the moment they cut this linker region, what do we get? We get a small amount of DNA that is wrapped around nucleosome. The DNA opens up. So what do we get? We get uniform fragments of DNA. So that can be run on a agarose gel and we can observe this DNA fragments on an agarose gel. Now remember in a normal cell, the caspase activated DNA is not free. It remains in a complex of CAD ICAD. ICAD means inhibitor of caspase activated DNA. So ICAD and CAD remain as partners in the cytoplasm. Whenever the apoptotic pathway starts, the apoptotic pathway finally results in the activation of a group of enzymes or proteases known as caspases. These caspases come and removes this ICAD. The moment they remove this inhibitor of CAD, CAD is activated, CAD then moves forward to cleave the DNA, in, uh, to cleave the DNA, and this results in the production of the DNA fragments, which forms a ladder pattern in gel electrophoresis. So these are two standard processes of detecting apoptosis at the biochemical level and at the molecular level. Now coming to difference uh, to have a very brief insight on the difference between the basic and the known two types of cell death. When I started to this class, uh, after show on, in the third or the fourth sli slide, I showed you that there are different types of cell death of which two cell deaths are more important. One is necrosis, that is the traumatic cell death, and the other is apoptosis, that is a programmed cell death. So as you can see, whenever there is in trauma, you can see swelling of the cell, the cell burst and all its contents are liberated, results in inflammation. Just a second. So as now, when necrosis happens, you can see there's an inflammatory response. You can see this Y-shaped structures, these are antibodies. They come and bind to a number of proteins uh, of the cell that has bursted out. So this is an inflammation. But when there is apoptosis, 
first nuclear fragmentation cell fragments and then the engulfment of the apoptotic bodies by the neighboring cell so this is a phagocytic cell you can see and this is the engulf engulfed dead cell and now coming to the worm where first this phenomenon of apoptosis started horvis in 1999 as I told you, explain that during the development, this worm, Synod habditis elegans, this is the worm, it loses its one, started with that story, it loses its 131 cells. So this loss of 131 cells is due to apoptosis. We'll not be getting into the details of the worm pathway because that is not a part of your syllabus. Just to give you a brief of the, uh, briefing into the names of the proteins that are involved in this pathway, there is this CD9 protein that remains bind to CD4 protein. Whenever there is developmental cues, that means 131 cells needs to die because the, cell, the larva needs to mature. I mean, the worm needs to mature into an adult worm. You can see the CD4 is removed by another protein known as EGL1. The moment CD4 is removed, it is free. And once it is free, it forms a wheel-like complex. In this complex, it recruits another protein, which is CD3. CD3 is activated. And once CD3 is activated, this protein brings about the cellular death of all those cells in which this CD3 is activated. So that is in brief the story of C. elegans. I just wanted to show you a comparison, the similarity between the worm pathway and the pathway of apoptosis operative in the mammalian cells. So you can see CD3 is finally activated and apoptosis, just now we discussed. CD is nothing, but in mammalian cells, it is caspases. So, as you can see, there was this activation cascade that resulted in the activation of this enzyme. In mammalian cells also, there is an activation cascade that results in the activation of this enzyme, the caspase. And once the caspase is activated, it proceeds forwards to cleave its target proteins, which will finally result in the cleaving of the DNA. So that was just drawing a similarity on the two pathways. And the importance of apoptosis lies in the fact that it's important for normal development, maintenance of tissue homeostasis. The old cells need to die. Cells with defective DNA need to die. Cells with DNA whose telomere has been shortened to critical length need to die. So it maintains tissue homeostasis. As I said, it is effective in the immune system. A defective cell, a cell with which is infested with pathogens, need to die from the immune point. So apoptosis has a normal physiological function in our body. As you can see in metazoans, you have all studied a tadpole has a tail, but the adult frog does not have it. Also, how does the tail vanish? So the cells are, so are instructed to die in apoptotic death. In case of digits, there are, you can see, segments of living cells present in between the digits. And it is via the process of apoptosis, the cells are forced to die in between the digits, so sculpting of the digits. So this is the importance of uh, apoptosis. And as you can see, it is a normal physiological function. And with this, we start our first, first pathway. <coughs> we'll be doing our extrinsic pathway today. So with this basic introduction in apoptosis, where we understand the biochemical changes that takes place in a, a apoptotic cells, we understood how we, uh, how we can differentiate it from the very other common type of cellular necrosis. We start with the first pathway of apoptosis. Now, to just uh, give a brief introduction to the pathways of apoptosis, Apoptosis or programmed cell death in a cell can follow two basic pathways. 
The first is the extrinsic or the death receptor pathway. And the second is the intrinsic or the mitochondrial pathway. Both these pathways, when you will, when we have walked through the entire pathway of apoptosis, you will see that both these pathways finally converge into an uh, enzyme which is known as caspase 3, which results in DNA fragmentation, followed by degradation of cytoskeletal and nuclear proteins, cross-linking of proteins, formation of apoptotic bodies, and expression of ligands for phagocytic cell receptors, and finally up uptake by phagocytic cells. So there are two pathways and I'm starting with the extrinsic pathway today. And when we start with the extrinsic pathway, we need to know about the enzymes that actually bring about the cleavage of the target substrates. First of all, keep it in mind that just like we studied the cyclin dependent kinases or the phosphatases, they were enzymes having defined function. These are also enzymes having defined functions. These are enzymes that goes and cuts a target protein. Now, the property of these enzymes are that all these enzymes have a cysteine amino acid in their active site. You can understand that whenever an enzyme binds with a substrate, an enzyme has an active site. So these group of enzymes has cysteine on their active site, the cysteine amino acid in their active site. And when they are cutting their target proteins, they cleave their target proteins at specific aspartic acid residues. So you can understand the two defined property of these enzymes. They have cysteine in their, these enzymes, so these are nothing but polypeptides. So these enzymes have cysteine in their active site and when they cut their targets, they do so at specific aspartic acids. Therefore, they are called caspases. The C stands for cysteine and the ASP, the name is caspases. Let me, so if you see the name is caspases, the C st stands for cysteine and the ASP stands for aspartic acid. And the last connotation ASE is means it is an enzyme which can go and cut its target protein. So that is about the nomenclature of caspases. Now, whenever this, you can understand that these enzymes are a very vital, critical, and a threatening category of enzymes. Because if they are always present in the cell in an active form, one way or the other, they will go and cleave target molecules. Because aspartic acid is an amino acid that is present in a lot of number of proteins present in our cell. So in normal condition, it is a risk to keep them activated. So you can understand that in normal condition, you can assume that they are not kept activated in the cell. They remain inactivated in the cell. So when caspases are synthesized in the cell, they are synthesized as inactive precursors or pro-caspases. And only when pro-caspases are activated, they become active caspases. The pro-caspases for the activation of a pro-caspases to active caspase, again, a proteolytic cleavage is essential. You can see this is an inactive pro-caspase. Let us look at the structure of a pro-caspase. As I said, this is nothing but a protein. So it has an amino terminal and it has a carboxy terminal. And you can see it is having a large subunit and a small subunit. And at the interface, you can see there's a present of an aspartic acid. So what happens? If you look into this structure, this procaspase is kept in an inactive manner. Only when it is activated, it assumes the active conformation. 
So you can see it is uh, it's written here cleaved by an initiator caspase. So this procaspase is cleaved to generate the active caspase. So look at the structural difference between a procaspase and the active caspase. The procaspase is harmless, but only a procaspase when cleaved at particular sites. You can see it is cleaved at the two aspartic residues. And on cleaving at the two aspartic interfaces, you can see we are getting this smaller fragments. And the smaller fragments then rearrange to form a tetramer and we get an active caspase. So that is how initially, even though they are present in the active condition in the cytoplasm, but if there is an apoptotic stimuli, this inactive procaspases are converted to active caspases. Now let us come into the different family that falls under this caspases. If you look into the general structure of this category of enzyme, you can see that there are three parts to this enzyme. The first part is known as the prodomain, the amino terminal part. So the first part is the prodomain, compare the prodomain. So that's the amino terminal part. In next comes the large subunit. So you see the large subunit followed by the small subunit. You can see the small subunit, which is the C terminal N. At the interspace between the prodomain and the large subunit is a cleavage site <coughs> where an aspartic acid is present. And again, at the interface between the large subunit and the small subunit is a cleavage site where again, and aspartic acid is present. So you can understand that these two cleavage sites are the sites where the enzyme, the, pro, the caspases, the procaspases can be cut, okay? Now, if we look into the family of caspases present or operative during apoptosis, you can see there are three families of caspases, three categories of caspases that are involved in apoptosis. One category of caspases are the initiator caspases. The second category are the executional caspases. And the third category are the inflammatory caspases. So there's the three categories. Look at the structural difference between the three categories. When you are studying the initiator caspases, there are four caspases written under this caspase 8, caspase 10, caspase 9, caspase 2. If you look into caspase 8 and caspase 10, at the prodomain region, you can see some blocks. You can see the red blocks. These are the red blocks. And these red blocks are known as death effector domain. I'll come to the importance of this domain later on. So there is a domain present in the Prodomain of the initiator caspase 8 and 10, which is known as the death effector domain. And again, in the case of the initiator caspase 9 and 2, you are seeing a prodomain present. And in the prodomain, there's an orange block present, which is known as caspase activity recruitment domain or CARD. In other words, it's also known as caspase recruitment domain or CARD. So under initiator caspases, as you can observe, there are again two categories, eight and 10, having DED in their prodomain region, nine and two having CARD in their prodomain region. The remainder of the structure is same. All the four initiator caspases has a large subunit and a small subunit and the two previous sites. Just to give you a brief view here, that eight and 10 initiator caspases are involved in the extrinsic pathway. And hence their prodomain has DED and the nine and two pro, uh, caspases are involved in the intrinsic apoptotic pathway. And hence their prodomain has CARD. Importance of DED and CARD will be discussed when I'll be doing the pathway. Now coming to the next category of caspases, that is the executional caspases, as you can understand by the name, one who executes. 
you have a, if you if you read a history, historical story a execution is a one who finally beheads a man initially in historic times whenever a, a prisoner was forced to go to was uh, forced to die and it was this executioner's role who used to give the verdict of death it was he used to either um, let the either uh, um, put a noose in the neck of the dying man or it was he who used to behead the man so you can understand by from that concept if you look into this category of enzyme the executioner caspase you can understand that they are the killers so this executioner caspase will move into the nucleoplasm and will cleave the dna rather let me put it with this way this executioner caspase will go and cleave the icad i told you about icad and cad inhibitor of caspase activated dnas and caspase activated dnas remains as partners so this executioner caspase goes and cleaves off the icad so that the dnas is a free they move and go to fragment the dna the executioner caspase is then then bring about the fragmentation of the nuclear elements by cleaving various proteins associated with the nucleus they cleave various proteins associated important proteins associated with the cytoplasm and the cell is forced to i mean to the cell moves on to the final steps of apoptotic death and the last category is inflammatory cas uh, caspases we are not getting into the details of inflammatory caspases because we will restrict ourselves to the extrinsic and the intrinsic part of apoptosis and for that we briefly need to have the concept of the initiator caspases and the executioner caspases mind it initiator caspases are not able to cleave any other target proteins they are able to cleave the executioner caspases once this initiator caspases cleave the executioner caspases then only the executioner caspases are activated and once they are activated they only can cleave various proteins so initiator caspases comparatively are more harmless as compared to executioner caspases so executioner caspases are activate last activated last executioner caspases are activated only if initiator caspases are activated now the question automatically comes that if executioner caspases are activated by initiator caspases then who activates the initiator caspases because as i said every caspase has a structure similar to this that is in active form but when they be need to become active they need to convert themselves into this tetramer formation for this tetramer formation cleavage is required in their cleavage sites so initiator caspases also needs to be cleaved how are they cleaved now as i said apoptosis has two defined pathway the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway in the extrinsic pathway the initiator caspases are activated in one manner and in the intrinsic pathway the initiator caspases are activated in another manner for today we will restrict our concept to extrinsic pathway so the caspases for extrinsic pathway are caspase 8 and 10 keep it in mind so just to summarize once more caspases are in have two basic categories initiator and executioner caspases the initiator caspases are 8 and 10 for the extrinsic pathway 2 and 9 for the intrinsic pathway and hence they have two different kinds of domains in the pro domain region and the executioner caspases are 3 6 and 7 and it is executioner caspases that finally brings about the apoptotic death of the cell this is the inactive form of a caspase as you can see the inactive form of a caspase has been shown here and this inactive form of a caspase is being activated to be converted into this tetrameric formation 
How that is being done, I'll discuss it from the next slide. And you can see again, this is the initiator caspases. There are certain proteins, as you can see, known as adapter proteins, which are activating these initiator caspases to form the tetramer structure. So this is the initiator caspase. Now let us concentrate on this initiator caspase. And as I was talking, each initiator caspase has a prodomain region. If you look into the compare the structure, it has a prodomain region, a large subunit, a small subunit. So similarly, so this is the prodomain region. This is the large subunit, this is the small subunit. Now look at what it is written in this particular diagram. The prodomain region has been now written as the adapter binding domain. And the large and the small subunit has been written together as a protease domain, which indicates that it is a large and the smaller subunit that is actually the functional enzyme. And that adapter domain is required for the activation of the functional enzyme. Now in the cell, there are adapter proteins that recognizes this adapter domains binds to this adapter domains in form of dimers. You can see two adapter proteins are binding to two initiator caspases. And in this complex, you can see the initiator caspases are then converted into this tetrameric formation. And this tetramer is the active caspase. Once we get an active initiator caspase, this active initiator caspase will then in turn activate this downstream procaspase, executioner procaspase into an active executioner caspase. And once this active executioner caspase is obtained, we will see the cleavage of multiple substrates. So when we are talking about the functions of caspase, so the executioner caspase, as I said, they are the main killers. So you can see the targets of this caspase is inhibitor of DNA. So it removes ICAD, bringing about DNA fragmentation. It fragments the nuclear lamines. So fragmentation of nucleus. It fragments different cytoskeletal proteins. So cytoskeletal disruption, cell fragmentation, membrane blabbing. It <coughs> fragments the Golgi matrix proteins, fragmentation of Golgi, and the scramblase. It activates the scramblase as a result of which phosphatidylserine is moved from the inner lipid, uh, inner leaflet of the lipid bilayer to the outer leaflet of the lipid bilayer. So in this nutshell of what the functions the executioner caspases carry out. Mind it, these are the functions of the executioner caspases. The function of the initiator caspase is only to activate the executioner caspase. But once the executioner caspases are activated, they bring about this variety of functions. Now, when we start the story of the extrinsic pathway, as you can understand extrinsic, that means the signals for the death are coming from outside the cell. Extrinsic means outside, so it's coming from outside the cell. So we have studied cell signaling, and whenever there is a death signal coming from outside the cell, it is a signal. Remember, if you remember your cell signaling class, if any signal is a ligand, and a signal in molecule is perceived by the re receptors present on the cell surface. So in this case also, any signaling molecule bearing the information of death during the message of death is the death ligand. And this ligand will bind with the receptors present on the membrane of the cell, which will now be instructed to die a cellular apoptotic death. So a specific target cell is being asked to die a apoptotic death. A death ligand is moving towards that cell automatically there are receptors present on the plasma membrane that will be activated by this death ligand. These are the variety of death receptors present on the surface of the plasma membrane, as you can see. 
These are nothing but transmembrane proteins consisting of an extracellular ligand binding domain, a small transmembrane domain, and as you can see, an intracellular death domain, the blue blocks, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Look at the yellow blocks. So they have a domain, which is the death domain. So this is typical of all death receptors. All death receptors have a ligand binding domain, a transmembrane domain, <coughs> an intracellular death domain, intracellular cytoplasmic part, which is containing the death domain. When the cell is normal, these receptors are present as monomers. That is, they're present as single, alone. They're present alone on the surface of the plasma membrane. But if a death message or a death ligand starts moving towards the target cell, as a result of that, these receptors, these death receptors then tends to cluster. They move through the plasma membrane. You know that the plasma membrane is fluid in nature and protein movement occurs through the plasma membrane. So these receptors start moving through the plasma membrane to form trimers. That is sets of three. The receptors combine in sets of three. Let's look at the picture. So this is the death receptors and the receptors as you see have combined in sets of three once they have received the death signal or once they have <clears throat> been attached with the death signal ligand. The moment they move in sets of three, if you remember our earlier slide, I said that there is this death domain present on the cytoplasmic side of these monomers, monomeric receptors. Whenever they combine in sets of three, the death domain associates with each other and become activated. The moment the death domains becomes activated, these death domains then recruit an adapter protein present in the cytoplasm. Interestingly, this adapter protein has two parts. One part can bind with the dead domain and the other part can bind with the initiator caspases and hence they're known as adapters. They actually form a link between the receptor and the initiator caspases. So once more, if we look into this picture, see, this is a lymphocyte. The fast ligand has been expressed. So the lymphocyte is instructing this target cell to die. The moment the fast ligand has been, is moving towards this target cell, you can see the death receptors have trimerized. Ligand receptor binding has occurred. But prior to that, look at the adapter protein. I said in the cytoplasm, there are adapter proteins. These adapter proteins has two parts. Look at the red and the blue block. The red block is the death domain. A death domain is also present as a red block in the receptor. And the blue part is the death effector domain, DED. If you remember our initiator caspase 8, an initiator caspase 8 also has a DED domain present in its pro-domain region. So the adapter protein on one hand can bind with the receptor at the cytoplasmic end, and the adapter protein can also bind with the inactivated initiator caspase. So inactivated initiator procaspase. So once a lymphocyte decides to kill a cell, it goes and binds with the target cell, that receptor trimerization is occurring, and the death domain of the receptors are active, <clears throat> and this activated death domain then recruits the adapter proteins. Now, the ligand by which this death receptors are activated is known as the fast ligand. This is present on the surface of T lymphocytes, lymphocytes of our body. Let's do, not get into T and B. They are present on the surface of certain lymphocytes of our body. Now, these lymph uh, ligands are known as fast ligands. So the fast ligands, when binds with this corresponding receptors, the receptors are known as fast death receptors. So the fast ligand is binding with the fast death receptors and the adapter proteins that the fast death receptor is recruiting are known as fast associated adapter proteins. 
So they are fad, that is fast associated, uh, associated dead domain containing adapter proteins. So they are fad. So fast ligand binds with fast receptor and recruits fad. Again, fad has a dead domain by which the red block by which it binds with the receptor part and the blue block containing the DED by which it, with which it binds with the DED of the initiator procaspase 8. So you can see the initiator procaspase 8 has become bound with the adapter protein, which is in turn attached to the dead receptor. And it is this signaling complex that is known as the death inducing signaling complex. And within this death inducing signaling complex, the two procaspase molecules, see the procaspase molecules, the procaspase molecules of caspase 8 are cleaved to generate an active caspase 8. You can see, so the procaspase 8 is cleaved to generate an active caspase 8 containing four polypeptide segments. Once we have this activated caspase 8, if you remember, this activated caspase 8 will now go and activate procaspase 3. Once procaspase 3 is activated, it will then go and bring about the cellular death of that cell in which this process has started. So as you can see, we, this was a death inducing signaling complexes, activated caspase 8, activation of the execution of caspase is caspase 3, and the apoptotic of the target cell. This is another picture of the same pathway. See the death receptors binding with the death ligand, the adapter protein fad recruited to the cytoplasmic end of the death receptors via the death domains. The adapter proteins are now recruiting procaspase 8 via their death effector domain and via the death effector domain of the procaspase 8. The procaspase 8 then are activated to produce initiator caspase 8. The initiator caspase 8 then move downstream to activate caspase 3. To activate procaspase 3, procaspase 3 is activated to give rise to executioner caspase 3. And once the executioner caspase 3 is activated, it brings about apoptosis. So this is in nutshell the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis. And we'll stop our class here today. This is one pathway in which the cellular death is being inflicted on a target cell. Mind it, as you saw from this pathway, the death ligand or the signal of death came from exterior of the cell. And accordingly, the cell was instructed to die and ultimately the cell chose to die. It, once it has been instructed, every, every other thing is programmed. Because so once the message of death is received, you can see that everything is programmed. The receptor trimer, trimerization occurs. The cytoplasmic activation of the death domain occurs in the receptor. Automatically, the adapter proteins are recruited to the receptor. The death effector domains of the adapter proteins are activated. The initiator caspases are recruited to the adapters. The initiator procaspase is activated to initiator caspases. And the initiator caspases then activate the executionary procaspases to executionary caspases and apoptosis. This is a very schematic summarization of what is written. See, the death ligand is binding with the death receptor. The death domain of the receptors are activated. The adapters are binding to the death receptor. The adapters in turn are activated. The adapters are recruiting procaspase 8. Death inducing signaling is formed. Within the death inducing signal, signaling complex, you can see the autocatalytic activation of procaspase 8 to active caspase 8. Active caspase 8 is generated. Once active caspase 8 is generated, it moves on to activate the procaspases, um, executionary procaspases. The executionary caspases are activated, brings about apoptosis. So that is extrinsic pathway for today.